Welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Holotube seminar. And we are very happy to have Andy O'Bannon tell us um, about central charges and of um, boundaries and defects. So Andy, please take it away. Thanks. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, good. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak uh, about central charges of two-dimensional boundaries and defects. Um, slides are not moving. Ah, okay, there we go. Um, so the talk is based on a series of papers that I've written over the past six years now um, with lots of collaborators, including Adam Chalabi, who's my student now in Southampton, John Estes, uh, who's on Long Island, Chris Herzog, who's in London, Darya Krim, who's in Brooklyn, Christian Jensen, who's now in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, uh, Brandon Robinson, who was my former postdoc, now a postdoc in Leuven, uh, Ronnie Rogers, former student, now a postdoc in Orda, and Jacopo Assisti, who's a, uh, my former postdoc, who's now in Uppsala. And this is my chance just to point out that Adam and Brandon are applying for jobs right now. So <laughs> if you're looking for a good postdoc, uh, I recommend them. So what I'm gonna talk about, um, I will begin with some motivation, um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the central charges of 2D CFTs, just to remind you of some key facts, uh, because then I'll talk about the systems that we actually study, these two-dimensional boundaries and defects, and I'll compare and contrast them to 2D CFTs. And then the main part of the talk, I'll try to summarize the state of the art as far as um, boundary and defect central charges, um, what we know about them so far, and then depending on how much time we have, uh, I'll go through some examples and then I'll end with some summary and outlook. So let's start with the motivation. Um, so the title of my talk is Central Charges of Two-Dimensional Boundaries and Defects. So I'll start by defining what I mean by two-dimensional boundaries and defects. Um, so I'm gonna be considering conformal field theories or CFTs um, with the boundary in space, um, plus some conformally invariant boundary conditions, and then possibly plus some massless degrees of freedom at the boundary and coupled to the bulk CFT degrees of freedom. Um, that's the definition of what's called a boundary conformal field theory or BCFT. And uh, I'm gonna consider three dimensional BCFTs. Uh, I should say I will be in Euclidean signature throughout the talk unless stated otherwise. So D equals three B CFTs. And uh, I've drawn a cartoon picture here um, with my three directions, X, Y, and Z uh, of space. And my boundary is this blue uh, plane at uh, X equals zero. So the boundary uh, will be at the Y, Z plane at X equals zero. So it'll be a two-dimensional boundary. And, and also um, I'm gonna assume my boundary is flat unless stated otherwise. Why would you care about this? Well, there's lots of examples. Um, so for example, there's the critical easing model in three dimensions with the boundary. Um, also graphene with the boundary. So graphene, if you remember the um, leading approximation, the low energy effective description is massless Dirac fermions, which is a CFT in three dimensions. And then if you cut a graphene sheet, you'll get a boundary. So you can get a, a BCFT that way. And then more formally uh, or more theoretically uh, in M theory, um, you can have M2 brains ending on M5 brains. And from the point of view of the M2 brains, uh, the low energy world volume theory on the M2 brains is a three-dimensional CFT. And then when they end on the M5 brains, that introduces a boundary. And then actually related to that, uh, in string theory, there's lots of constructions of brains ending on other brains that can give you three-dimensional B CFTs. And then related to that, um, in holography, there's lots of examples of these kinds of systems. And so there's lots of, and there's even more that I haven't listed here. There's lots of examples, both real and you know, experimental, as well as theoretical of this type of thing. Um, I'm also gonna consider CFTs with conformally invariant defects. So this means uh, I'm going to impose some boundary conditions along a submanifold and or introduce massless degrees of freedom supported on a submanifold, a two-dimensional submanifold, um, possibly, and those degrees of freedom are possibly coupled to the bulk CFT. Uh, it's the definition of a defect conformal field theory. Uh, in this case, it can be three-dimensional or higher. I could have a two-dimensional defect and a four-dimensional CFT or a five or six-dimensional CFT um, and so on. And so here's my picture again. Uh, so again, my, my defect in this case will be this blue plane, uh, which again, I will assume to be flat. 
And again, the directions along my defect will be Y and Z. And then now the, the transverse directions can now be a vector X. So I can have more than one of them. And why would I care about these? Well, again, there's lots of examples. So in the critical easing model in three dimensions, for example, you can have a domain wall. So you could imagine on half of space, all the spins are pointing up. On the other half of space, they're all pointing down with the domain wall in between. That would be my defect. Uh, graphene also has different types of line defects with this uh, you know, two-dimensional or uh, one plus one dimensional defects of different types. And then again, uh, in M theory, uh, M2 is ending on M5s. From the point of view of the M5 brain, um, on the M5 brain, you'll get at low energy, a, a six dimensional CFT. And then the end of the M2 brain would look like a two dimensional defect. And actually that's one of my examples that I might get to later. And then again, related to that in string theory and in holography, there's lots of ways to engineer this type of thing. So there's lots of uh, reasons to study them. Um, the main question uh, for this talk is, can we define central charges for these types of two-dimensional conformal boundaries and defects? Um, and as I hope to convince you by the end of the talk, the answer is yes, although it'll be a little different from a 2D CFT. Um, so when I say central charge, of course, you should think first of a, a 2D CFT where you have a Eurasoro algebra and that has a central extension term whose coefficient is the definition of the central charge. And then, of course, in a 2D CFT, the central charge is really important. <clears throat> in particular, it shows up in lots of other quantities, and I've written some of them here, like it fixes the normalization of the stress tensors two-point function, it shows up in the thermal entropy, it shows up in the trace anomaly, it shows up in the uh, entanglement, uh, at least in the CFT vacuum, the entanglement of an interval, and so on. Um, so it's a really important quantity for 2D CFTs. It's also important because of the C theorem uh, proven by Zama Logikov in 1986, which states that under an RG flow from a UV CFT to an IR CFT, the central charge has to decrease or at least uh, not increase. And uh, that's a really important theorem because if you look at Zama Logikov's proof, he assumed very minimal ingredients. He assumed Euclidean symmetry, which is just the Euclidean signature version of Poincaré symmetry. So in Euclidean signature, it means rotations and translations. Um, he also assumed locality and reflection positivity, which is the Euclidean signature version of unitarity. And so he, he just assumed these very general things, uh, which are pretty minimal assumptions for like a, a healthy, reasonable quantum field theory. And using those, he was able to prove uh, the C theorem. And so as a result, it's a very powerful and uh, some people say universal constraint on quantum field theories. All right, because he assumes such minimal ingredients, it applies to a huge number of, of theories. And so it's very powerful um, and very important for that reason. Um, furthermore, all, this, all these facts about the central charge, all the places that it appears and the fact that it obeys the C theorem is why we think of the central charge as counting the number of degrees of freedom, um, which indeed we expect to decrease as you go along in our, our G flow and massive modes decouple. But which uh, yeah, the number of degrees of freedom can be difficult to define in a interacting field theory. So it's non-trivial to have <clears throat> something that you can prove decreases. However, uh, that's all for a 2D CFT, but we're interested in these two-dimensional boundaries and defects. And what I'll try to argue, and what I'll show you is that in general, you don't have the Virasoro algebra. And so you can't define the central charge that way. Furthermore, all these other quantities um, become more complicated. Um, and in fact, some of them, we, we don't know the generic form. Some of them we do, some of them we don't. And so this is why the question becomes interesting of, well, um, can you still define uh, some kind of central charge? Is there anything analogous? Um, can you prove things like C theorems and so on? So how much can you say? And so that's what I'm gonna try to, to do in the talk is give you the current state of the art. Um, so with all that as motivation, what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna go back to 2D CFTs and I'm gonna talk about the central charge a little bit. I'm, I won't go into too much detail. I'm just gonna review some important things that I'll need for later. And I'll mainly review things that are going to, a lot of things that will probably change when we get to boundaries and defects. Um, so um, from a modern point of view, uh, a quantum field theory is a renormalization group flow from the UV or microscopic or high energy scales to the infrared or macroscopic or low energy scales. And I'll define a few things that I'll need later. Um, I'll define a generating functional Z uh, the generator of connected correlation functions. And I will also introduce a non-dynamical background metric, G mu nu. And with those two things, I can define probably, I think what will be the main actor in the story, which is the stress energy tensor T mu nu, uh, which I've defined this way as um, minus two over root G, that's G is the determinant of the metric. Uh, 
and then variation with respect to the inverse metric of log z. And with that definition, uh, you can see the stress tensor will be symmetric. And if I set the metric to be flat, which in Euclidean signature means it's a Kronecker delta, um, then the translational and rotational symmetry by Noether's theorem tells me that the stress tensor is conserved. Um, of course, this is true more generally, like local diffeomorphism invariance tells me it's covariantly conserved. But I want to emphasize the symmetries because, again, I'm going to introduce a boundary and defects, and I'll break these symmetries, and, and this will change. But anyway, for now, um, the symmetries tell me that my stress tensor is conserved. And then conformal field theories show up as fixed points of the RG flow. So generically, you'll have a flow from a UV CFT to an IR CFT. Um, so let me define CFTs a little more precisely. So, well, first of all, let me define a conformal transformation. So it's a diffeomorphism. So essentially a change of coordinates from X to X prime, such that the uh, metric is invariant except for an overall conformal factor e to the two omega. Um, Hopefully this is all familiar so far. And in fact, just taking that definition of the conformal transformation and combining it with my definition of the stress tensor, you find that the uh, trace of the stress tensor is one over root G times variation of log Z with respect to this factor omega, the conformal factor or the vial factor omega. So a CFT is then defined as something invariant under conformal transformations so that in particular, this variation has to vanish which tells me that my trace of the stress tensor has to vanish, right? So this is the word identity for conformal invariance. The trace of the stress tensor has to vanish. And again, uh, these things will change in just a minute, but um, if I continue. Um, so again, if I take my metric to be flat and I'm in dimension greater than two, um, then the conformal group is generated by, by these transformations. So you have the rotations and the translations, which act in the usual way on the coordinates. Those things together are what I call the Euclidean group. And then the conformal group also includes the dilatations, which are just the rescalings of the coordinates and the special conformal transformations, which are more complicated, but I've written them there, parameterized by some constant vector B mu. And all of these things together uh, generate the conformal group of flat space in Euclidean signature, which is SO B plus one comma one. And then since we're interested in two dimensional CFTs and then later two dimensional boundaries and defects, um, I'll talk about D equals two specifically. It's a special case for a couple of reasons. One is that in 2D, I can introduce complex coordinates. I'm in Euclidean signature, so I can introduce complex coordinates Z and Z bar. And then a conformal transformation is any holomorphic map of those coordinates. So Z goes to some holomorphic function W of Z and similarly for Z bar going to some W bar. Um, so that's special. You can have a natural way to introduce um, complex coordinates in two dimensions. Um, another thing really special about 2D CFTs is that the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic sectors decouple. And the way you see that is in the stress tensor. So here I've written my stress tensor as a, a matrix in these complex coordinates. Um, it's still symmetric, so the off-diagonal components, Z and Z, the ZZ bar and Z bar Z components are equal. And then in these coordinates, the trace is equal to just one or the other of those off-diagonal components. So in a CFT, that'll vanish. And uh, if I also look at my conservation equation, if I write it in these complex coordinates, and I've written um, one equation there, dz of the zz bar component plus dz bar of the zz bar <laughs> component equals zero, there's also the um, uh, conjugate equation. So if I take those two equations, uh, if I have a conformal field theory, so I have the conservation of the stress tensor and also my trace vanishes, if I put those together, um, I immediately find that ZZ, uh, the ZZ components is independent of Z bar and the Z bar Z, so it's holomorphic, strictly holomorphic, and the Z bar Z bar component is independent of Z, so it's strictly anti-holomorphic. And that's the sense in which holomorphic and anti-holomorphic decouple. Um, they just don't talk to each other. They don't exchange any energy or momentum. Or in Lorentzian signature, it's left moving and right moving. Um, but anyway, mathematically, because of this, I can do a Lorentz expansion of the ZZ component um, with some Lorentz coefficients LN. I can do the same thing in the anti-holomorphic part. And that gives me, and then you can go do a calculation and you can show that those Lorentz coefficients obey the Virasoro algebra. So here I've written it explicitly. Uh, there's one for LM, the LMs, and there's another one for the anti-holomorphic sector and they commute with each other, which I've written there. LM commutes with LN bar. I should say M and N are integers. So there's a couple of points I want to make about the Virasoro. Um, again, because later we won't have it. Um, 
But the first thing is that it's an infinite number of symmetry generators, right? There's an infinite number of these Lorentz um, of these uh, LMs. And that's a lot of the power of a 2D CFT um, that you have an infinite amount of symmetry. Um, the SO3 comma one, uh, the, what's called the global part of the conformal group in 2D, uh, or the SOD plus one comma one, which in two dimensions is SO3 comma one is still there. It's the subgroup generated by L plus or minus one and L zero and their anti-holomorphic counterparts. Um, it's just that you're also getting lots of the, uh, an infinite number of other generators that are uh, different. But the other, other thing I wanna point out is that here's explicitly, you see um, the appearance of the central charge. So here's the definition from this central extension term in the Virasoro algebra. And just repeat uh, this, the central charge constant number of degrees of freedom for the reasons I mentioned, it obeys the C theorem. Um, there's also a few other reasons to think that it counts degrees of freedom. One is that if you demand reflection positivity and that the vacuum state is normalizable, then you can show pretty quickly uh, that the central charge can't be negative, has to be greater than or equal to zero. And that's good for something that you want to count degrees of freedom. You don't want degrees of freedom to become negative the number of degrees of freedom to become negative. And then also, if you take your favorite 2D CFT and add to it a single free massless real scalar or a single free massless Dirac fermion, and by the way, those two things have to be the same by two-dimensional bosonization, then uh, with my choice of normalization for my central charge, it will just increase by one. And so in this way, you can see that the central charge at the very least can count free fields. Um, but of course, because of the C theorem, it, it can do more than just free fields. And like I mentioned, it, it appears in lots of places, um, many different observables, including the ones I've listed here. Um, and so I think what I'll do next, I, I will briefly go through each of these and just remind you a little bit about them. And again, I'm doing this because when we, when we consider defects and boundaries, these are all gonna change. <laughs> so uh, for the stress tensor two point function, I've written it here um, in complex coordinates. Uh, this is just for the holomorphic part. And in this case, uh, it's, it's fixed by the symmetries basically up to the overall factor, um, which is then fixed by the central charge, which uh, in my normalization is C over two. Uh, I won't say much more about it, except that um, Zamolodzikov in his proof of the C theorem, he used this form. He actually proved the C theorem at the level of the correlators of the stress tensor. Um, I think that was all I had to say. Yeah, okay. So then for the thermal entropy, um, also known as the Cardi entropy, uh, proven by Cardi, derived by Cardi back in 1986. Um, well, so Cardi considered uh, the CFT in a box of size L at a temperature T, and he considered the high temperature limit of T uh, much greater than one over L. Those are the only two scales in the problem. So he considered T much greater than one over L. And he found this result for the thermal entropy. Um, it scales with L because entropy is extensive, and then it has to be, entropy is also dimensionless. So, and the only other scale is the temperature. So that explains the factor of T. So that's why you get L times T, but then the question was, what's the number in front? And what Cardi showed um, was that the number in front is universal in the sense that it only depends on the central charge, uh, which again, with my normalization is pi over three times C. And so in this sense, actually, this is a, a very physical sense in which C counts degrees of freedom. It's counting the number of thermodynamic states in the system, uh, at least in this limit of high temperatures. Um, Next up is the trace anomaly. So for this one, I, I need to, uh, let me define what the trace anomaly is in case you forgot or you don't know. Um, so if I start in, in flat space with the flat metric and I have a CFT, so my uh, trace of the stress tensor vanishes. If I then introduce curvature, so I have a non-zero or a non-trivial metric, um, then quantum effects can break conformal invariance producing a non-zero trace. And this is called the trace anomaly. Um, and um, it can, in principle happen for a CFT in any dimension. However, um, for if D happens to be odd, um, for reasons that I'll explain later, you actually can't get a trace anomaly. So for odd dimensions, there is no trace anomaly, but in even dimensions, you can get one. And in particular, in two dimensions, uh, it's proportional to the Ricci scalar of the background space or space time. And then the coefficient in front is fixed by the central charge, C over 24 pi. This is a um, slightly less, intuitive way that C counts degrees of freedom. It's maybe more formal or abstract, but it is measuring the strength with which conformal symmetry will be broken when you have curvature. Uh, and then the final example I'll do, the final um, observable, I guess, uh, is entanglement entropy. So this is my one slide definition of entanglement. Uh, so this is in Lorentzian signature. So I have time and space. 
and I fix a time slice or more generally a Cauchy surface, but everything I'm going to do will be invariant under time translation. So I fix a time slice and then I have um, a density matrix row uh, and then I split space into two regions, A and its complement A bar. And then uh, by tracing out the states in A bar, I get the reduced density matrix for A, that's row A. And then the entanglement entropy is just the von Neumann entropy of the reduced density matrix. And uh, I'm going to I think uh, in this talk, I'm only going to consider zero temperature. I'm going to consider the vacuum. And uh, for the CFT case, I'll consider just an interval. And in that case, for an interval of length L, um, there's the famous result from uh, Holsey, Larson, and Wilczek, as well as Cal Calabresi and Cardi, that the entanglement entropy of a 2D CFT is logarithmic in L. So it goes as log of L over epsilon, and the coefficient in front is the central charge over three. And then there's non-universal terms. And the first thing to say is, yes, the entanglement entropy depends on the cutoff, so it appears to be unphysical. However, um, when you get a log like this, the coefficient in front is actually invariant under rescalings of the cutoff, and so it's physical. And in fact, you can extract the physical information by taking essentially a logarithmic derivative, so this L times DDL of the entanglement, and then multiplying by three, which is just some normalization factor. Um, but that'll give you the coefficient in front of the log, which in this case is the central charge C. And this also is a way, it's another sense in which the central charge measures degrees of freedom because the entanglement is measuring the amount of entanglement uh, in, in the states, which in this case is a, the vacuum of the CFD, or at least the entanglement between the degrees of freedom in the interval with everything outside. So maybe a slightly more intuitive way of measuring degrees of freedom. Um, I think that's all I was gonna say about a 2D CFD and all the places that the central charge appears because now um, we will move on to boundaries and defects, um, in which case we won't have the virus or algebra and all of these things will change. <laughs> so um, that's where I'm going next. I guess this is a good time to pause and ask if there's any questions. I can't see the chat, so you either have to, somebody has to tell them to me. But um, Don't worry, we take care of the chat. I will let you know if there's questions. There's none. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so far it's all review. So I assume it's familiar to most of you. Um, so now let's move on to the boundaries and defects. So the systems we actually study. So we're gonna be starting with the CFT in flat space of dimension three or greater with conformal group SOD plus one comma one. And we're gonna introduce our two dimensional boundary or defects. Uh, and so the conformal group will be broken to a subgroup that preserves the boundary or defects maximal subgroup uh, that will preserve the boundary or defect. And so what is that? Um, okay, so let's start with the rotations. Um, so these will generically be broken to rotations in the YZ plane where the defect is, because I'm a, because I'm assuming I have a flat defect, plus any rotations I might have in the transverse directions. So among rotating the X, the coordinates of this X vector among each other. Uh, the translations will generically be, bro be broken and all the transverse directions, they'll generically be broken and then they'll be preserved um, in the YZ directions. So they'll be broken to translations along Y and Z. Uh, the dilatations will be unbroken and they will be, they'll act the same way on all the coordinates. Um, so this is why I'm considering boundaries and defects that can describe fixed points. Um, so there'll be dilatation invariants. And then the special conformals, they're broken to a subset where, so I should say, yeah, as I mentioned, they're parameterized by this vector B mu, and they get broken to the subset where all the components of B mu perpendicular or normal to the defects or boundary have to be zero. And in more intuitive terms, uh, if you remember special conformal transformations, they consist of an inversion, a translation, and then another inversion. Um, these get broken with the boundary or defect, they're broken to the subset that involve inversions um, around points in the boundary or defect. But you still have some generically. Um, and then altogether, these form the group SO3 comma one cross SOD minus two, where the SO3 comma one are the conformal transformations that preserve the boundary defect and the SOD minus two are the rotations in the transverse directions around the defect. So that's, and this is probably the, you know, probably the best def definition of a boundary or defect actually in a CFT. It's the most rigorous just in terms of the symmetry. Any, any deformation that breaks the symmetry in this way, you would call a, a conformal defect or boundary. 
And the point I want to make, like I mentioned, is that generically you're not getting a whole virus Soro. You're only getting the SO3, one subgroup of the two-dimensional conformal group, the global part. And this was obvious from the start because you're starting with the conformal group in higher dimensions, SOD plus one comma one, which has a finite number of symmetry generators, and you're then breaking to a subgroup. So you have no reason to expect, at least generically, you have no reason to expect that you'll get an infinite number of generators and a Vera Soro subgroup. Uh, I will mention there are special cases where you can get Vera Soro, but I'm interested in the general case where you don't, where the, the, all the symmetry you have is this SO3 comma one cross SOD minus two. As I mentioned, you do have the SO3 comma one, um, which back in the Vera Soro group was coming from the L plus or minus one and L zero and their anti-holomorphic counterparts. Um, the word identities change. So that's the symmetry we're gonna have. Uh, it's less than we started with in the, in the CFD. Correspondingly, uh, the word identities are gonna change. Um, and so in order to write, I'm gonna write down some of them. I won't write down everything. Um, I'll just write down the ones I need. To write them down, I'm gonna split up my coordinates. Um, so I'm gonna start with my coordinates X mu, where mu goes from one to D, and I'm gonna split them into the ones along the boundary or defects. Those will be the X A, so A will be one or two. And then the ones that are transverse to the boundary or defects, those will be X I, so I goes from three up to D. So with those definitions, um, the first thing is that the stress tensor is no longer conserved. Uh, this is intuitive because when you introduce the boundary or defect, it, like I mentioned, it breaks um, translations, some of the rotations and translations. And in particular now in that word identity for the conservation of the stress tensor, now the right-hand side is not zero. It has a delta function um, that localizes to the boundary or defect. So this is a delta function in the directions transverse to the defect. And that's just telling you that the, the non-conservation only happens at the defect. So if you're at any point away from the boundary or defect locally, you'll still see energy and momentum conserved. But if you go to the defect, <clears throat> you'll see that it doesn't have to be. And that's because the degrees of freedom on the defect or boundary can exchange energy and momentum with the degrees of freedom in the bulk. Anyhow, um, sitting next to this delta function is an operator called the displacement operator di, which I'll talk about more in a minute. Um, it just it has, This is the definition of the displacement operator, this word identity, just whatever operator sitting there is the displacement operator. Um, actually, to give you a little more intuition about it, um, you can take, in these cases with a uh, boundary defect, you can take your stress tensor and you can split it up into a bulk part, uh, which I call the bulk, the first term there, the bulk contribution, plus some two-dimensional contribution that's localized on the boundary of defects. So there's a delta function there, again, that localizes to my boundary of defects, and then there's a two-dimensional tensor, TAB. And you can then do a Gaussian pillbox integration around the boundary of defect, uh, integration of the, the word identity at the top. And I won't write the most general case, I'll just, I'll consider the case of a boundary, so three dimensions with the boundary. Um, if you do that Gaussian pillbox integration, you learn a couple of things. One is you learn that the displacement operator in that case is proportional to the, the T per perp component of the stress tensor, the bulk stress tensor. <clears throat> evaluated at the boundary. Um, so that gives you some intuition for what D is. It, physically D, if you insert D into a correlator, it'll actually displace the, the boundary or defect in a normal direction. And then you also learn that the 2D part of the stress tensor, TAB, is not conserved. Um, so DA of T in two dimensional terms. So DA of TAB is not just zero, it's proportional to the TB per component of the bulk stress tensor evaluated at the boundary. And that's the explicit form where you see that, okay, the two-dimensional defector boundary will not have its own conserved stress tensor because it's exchanging energy and momentum with the bulk. Um, and this is actually why um, you don't get Virasoro, right? The argument I went through was you need a conserved 2D stress tensor, then you'll get, you know, holomorphic and anti-holomorphic will split, you'll get Virasoro. But generically in these cases, um, you don't, you don't have a conserved 2D stress tensor. The total energy and momentum are, you know, still conserved, but um, if you just look at 2D, they would not appear to be. Um, what else? I should mention, yeah, okay, conformal invariance, uh, the remaining conformal invariance that you have still requires um, the stress tensor, uh, the trace of the stress tensor to vanish, which means both the bulk and the boundary or defects contributions, uh, their traces should vanish. And I'll say one more thing about the displacement operator. So from the, it's uh, localized to the boundary or defect. So that's where it lives. And um, so it only depends on the XA coordinates, although it has an index I, so it's valued in the, the normal, it's a vector of the normal directions. 
And in fact, on the boundary of defect, it's a primary. It just looks like a scalar primary. Um, and its two-point function is then fixed by the symmetry. So it has to go as um, one over x to the fourth, xa to the fourth, with some normalization. And I'll, I'll actually talk about the normalization later. Uh, I guess that's it. Okay, that was all I was going to say about the systems um, and their symmetries, because now I'm going to start talking about the boundary and defect central charges. And again, if you have any questions, um, just stop me at any time. So here again, uh, just to repeat, in a 2D CFT, central charge comes from Vera Soro and shows up in lots of places. As I just argued, we will not generically not have Vera Soro, and so we can't define the central charge that way. All of these other things will change. And so the question is, what do they look like? Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each each of them, and I'll, I'll try to summarize the state of the art. And I'll start with the easy ones, which are the ones that we know the least about, <laughs> namely the stress tensor two-point function and the thermal entropy. Um, so the stress tensor two-point function, the so the question, no, so what is the form of a stress tensor two-point function in a CFT with a two-dimensional boundary or defect? So in principle, the answer has been written down in these papers uh, that I'm citing. Um, however, it's pretty ugly. Uh, because you have less symmetry than either, well, yeah, either a 2D CFT or a higher dimensional CFT. You have more um, tensor structures, um, and so it's unpleasant, and people haven't studied it very much. That's the point I really want to make. Um, people haven't looked at it very much. Um, they haven't really thought about how to get central charges from it. So I'm not going to talk about it very much. If you want, uh, we could maybe discuss it later, although I don't have much to say. I recommend that you look at these papers, especially, uh, I guess the nicest form of it is in the, the most recent paper from Herzog and Shrestha. And you do have a question now on the chat from Alex Wochen. Okay. Yeah, he asked um, the VD correlation is in 3D, but in the 3D bulk? No, so D, um, Sorry, uh, Andy, what I meant is when you were writing down the formulas, right, for the uh, DD scales like uh, at short distances, one over x to the fourth, right? Yeah. Uh, so so that's that's specific to 3D bulk, right? Or I am wrong? No, I don't think so. Um, because, okay. yeah, the, the word identity fixes its dimension, so that power of x is fixed. I, I see. That's because, that's because your boundary is always two-dimensional, I guess. Yeah, but it, it's I, also I true. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. So it's, it's in any D, but it's because the boundary is two-dimensional. Okay, I got it. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, where was it? Um, right. Oh, well, this is easy one. Yeah. So the thermal entropy, we know almost nothing. <laughs> um, that's probably the least understood out of all of them. We have, I mean, just a few examples that I could count on one hand, and there doesn't seem to be any pattern. Um, it's not as universal, I should say this, it's not as universal as a Cardi entropy. It depends on more details than that, which is not surprising because again, you don't have Vera So uh, what I will talk about though, the ones we actually do know something about are the trace anomaly and the entanglement. So that'll be most of the rest of the talk. Um, so just to remind you, uh, trace anomaly, again, you start in flat space with a CFT and so a vanishing trace to the stress tensor and then you introduce curvature and get a non-zero trace. And as I mentioned, um, this can happen just with the CFT, you can get a non-zero trace in even dimensions. And in 2D, you get uh, the Ricci scalar times the central charge. The question we're asking here though is, okay, now I have uh, my stress tensor that splits up into bulk and boundary or defect uh, parts. So there's some bulk part and some 2D part, and that extends the trace. So the trace also splits up into a bulk part and a, a 2D part. And we know in principle what the bulk part is that's been worked out. That'll just be the CFT part. Um, but we want to know what's the 2D part look like. So what is the trace of this 2D uh, stress tensor? I shouldn't call it a stress tensor, this, um, the 2D part of the trace anomaly. Um, luckily, this has been studied by many people over the last 20 years or so. Um, the most complete analysis was by Schwimmer and Tyson in 2008. They did the most general case. And so luckily, uh, I can just tell you the answer. We didn't have to compute it ourselves. Um, it was already known. Um, however, I will give you a little sketch of how it's done. So it, it, if you want to know what the form of a trace anomaly looks like in general, I mean, for a CFT or with a defect or anything else, it's actually a textbook exercise. Uh, it's Pochinsky volume one, I think chapter four. 
Um, step number one, um, you write down all the curvature and variance that you can build from the metric that have the right dimension to contribute to the trace of the stress tensor. And as an example, um, in a 4D CFT, I've written them at the bottom. There's Riemann squared, Riemann tensor squared, Ricci tensor squared, Ricci scalar squared, and box of Ricci scalar. And then those all come with some coefficients that a priori are undetermined. Step two, you impose what's called West amino consistency. Um, and this is ultimately the statement that uh, the vial group is abelian. So if you do two vial transformations with two vial parameters, omega one and omega two, it has to be the same as doing them in the opposite order. And in principle, that's trivial. Um, but what makes it non-trivial for the trace anomaly is that these curvature invariants like the Riemann tensor squared can have very complicated vial transformations. And so if you demand this uh, West amino consistency, it can actually give you non-trivial constraints on the coefficients, C1, 2, 3, and 4. It can eliminate them or at least you know, fix, fix linear combinations of them, um, things like that. So it can be a non-trivial constraint. And then step three, uh, you add local counter terms to your effective action or your generating functional and determine how they enter the trace. And then you can use them to fix some of the other coefficients. So in other words, uh, the trace anomaly does have some scheme dependence and you have to specify what scheme you're in um, or at least be aware of what the scheme dependence is. And for example, in the four dimensional case, you can actually, there's a counter term that can get rid of the box R term. And then whatever's left over at the end of this procedure is what you would call the scheme independent um, and therefore physical trace anomaly. And as I mentioned, so that's the procedure that you go through to find this result from the 2D case where the trace goes like um, the Ricci scalar. And you then have to do a few more steps to show that the coefficient is the central charge. Um, the 4D case, if you go through those steps, um, the way it's typically written um, not, is not in terms of the way I wrote it before. It's actually usually written this way with, um, in terms of these, with these two terms. The first one is the Euler density which I've written there in terms of the um, curvatures. And then the second term is the vial tensor squared. And each of these comes with a coefficient that a priori is undetermined. These are called um, the central charges A and C of a 4D CFT. It's sort of a misnomer because in general, they're not actually like, they don't come from some central extension term of some algebra, but anyway, in analogy with the 2D CFT, they're called A and C. There's one important point I want to make, um, which is that uh, the West amino consistency has a corollary. There's an implication of it, which is that um, because of West amino consistency, the trace anomaly itself has to be, when you integrate it over all space, it has to be conformally invariant. And that can happen in two ways, um, giving rise to two types of terms. There's type A terms, like the Euler density term, where uh, it changes under a vial transformation, it changes by a total derivative, so that then the integral over all space is invariant. But then the vial tensor term or vial squared term is what's called type B. And that means that under a vial transformation, it, it is just invariant. That'll be important in a second. Um, partly it's important because the type A terms, uh, the coefficients of the type A terms generically obey C theorems. Oh, there's one more thing, right. Uh, the West amino consistency has a further implication for the type A central charges, um, which is that they have to be independent of marginal couplings of the CFD proven by Osborne back in 1991. And as I mentioned, um, they generically obey C theorems. Although, yeah, at least in two and 4D, they've been proven to obey C theorems. Well, I review all of that because now let's go back to the one we're interested in. So that's the recipe to do it. And we have these two types of terms, type A and type B, and type A have some special properties. So what happens with our 2D stress tensor, or our 2D, um, I should say our 2D trace anomaly? Well, as I mentioned, it's been computed, so I can just show you what it is. So uh, I have one more slide Okay, before I show it. I need to give you a little bit of geometry of submanifolds because we're going to have a submanifold, our 2D boundary or defect. Um, so I introduced some world sheet, but I call world sheet coordinates, which are the coordinates of my boundary or defect, sigma 1 and sigma 2. I then have my target space coordinates x mu, and I have to prescribe the embedding of my defect or boundary into my target space. So that's x mu as functions of sigma a. And with that, um, I can define an induced metric on my boundary or defect. I'm gonna call that g hat ab, which is just the pullback of my bulk metric. And then from that, I can compute all my intrinsic curvature. So I can just take my induced metric, I can compute the um, Riemann tensor r hat abcd, and from there, a, Riemann, a Ricci tensor and a Ricci scalar. 
<clears throat> but a new ingredient, so I mean, compared to a CFT, a new ingredient is that this is a submanifold. And so I also have to worry about extrinsic curvature, K mu A B. And also I'll just, as notation, I'll define a mean curve, what's called the mean curvature A mu, which is the trace of the extrinsic curvature with respect to the induced metric. And so the point is that, okay, I have to define all these geometric quantities. And once I do, then I go through my three-step procedure. I write down all the, all the curvature invariants that could contribute to the trace. You know, I do West Amino consistency and I fi fix the counter terms. And at the end of that procedure, I get this trace anomaly. So this is what uh, the trace anomaly of a two-dimensional boundary or defect looks like. And what you'll see, uh, it has three terms. Uh, the first term is actually similar to a 2D CFT. <clears throat> it's just the Ricci scalar of the induced metric, R hat. But then there are two other terms. Um, the second term there uh, involving the extrinsic curvature, it's actually the traceless part of the extrinsic curvature squared. Um, and then the third term is uh, involves the vial tensor. So you, you take the pullback of the vial tensor to your boundary or defect, well, to your defect, and then you do a trace with respect to the induced metric. And it's the traces with respect to the induced metric. So generically, you don't just get zero. <laughs> and so at the end of this, the three-step procedure, you get these three terms in your defect or boundary trace anomaly. And each one uh, comes with a coefficient that a priori is undetermined. And I call those coefficients B, D1, and D2. And I've also chosen factors of two and pi and, and the signs just for convenience later. And so this is the first difference with a 2D CFT, um, that generically in the trace anomaly, you get more terms. And so you don't have just one central charge, you have three. And so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through each of these, um, B, D1, and D2, and I'm gonna tell you what we know about them um, because because for each of these, you could ask all the same questions that you ask in a 2D CFT. So you could ask, is it bounded from below? Um, does it obey a C theorem? Uh, does it show up in any other observables like correlation functions? And we know some of those answers and I'll, I'll try to summarize them now. So the very first thing I should point out, uh, the Ricci scalar term is type A. So if you do a conformal transformation, uh, it'll change by total derivative. And it's not immediately obvious, but um, you can show that the other two terms are type B. Um, so again, under a conformal transformation, they're just invariant. So I'm gonna go through all three of them. Let's start with B. Um, so the first thing is uh, that West Amino consistency requires that B is independent of any boundary or defect marginal coupling. So if you have a, a localized operator, an operator localized on the boundary or defect, if it's exactly marginal with respect to the boundary or defects, then B has to be independent of that. However, um, here's a, the first difference or another difference with the CFT. B can in general depend on marginal couplings of the bulk CFT. Uh, there are examples of that um, in the papers I list at the bottom. Um, so that's a novelty compared to an ordinary CFT. But um, what Lorenzo Bianchi showed back in 2019 is that if you have a if your bulk CFT has some supersymmetry, and if your boundary or your defect uh, preserves at least two-dimensional two comma zero SUSY, then he proved that B also has to be independent of the bulk marginal couplings as well. Um, I think that's all I had to say about the marginal couplings. Uh, the next thing about B is that while it's the coefficient of a type A term, so you can add a BAC theorem, just like you know, in a 2D or a 4D CFT, and the answer turns out to be yes, um, at least for an RG flow that's on the boundary or defect. So if you introduce at the boundary or defects an operator that's relevant with respect to the boundary or defects, then you can prove that uh, the value of B in the UV has to be greater than or equals to the value in the IR. Um, here again, uh, we proved this in 2015 using uh, Komergotsky and Schwimmer methods um, for the, those are, who are familiar, the experts in the room. <laughs> and then a few years later, Cassini, Landea, and Taroba uh, proved it using entanglement uh, methods, entanglement inequalities. And in both cases, the, assumption, the only assumptions that go into it are the Euclidean symmetry along the boundary or the defects locality and reflection positivity. So essentially the same basically the same assumptions that Zamolodzikov made, although with less symmetry than his case, I guess you don't have the whole Virasoro at the fixed points. But you don't need that. Um, actually, we were able to do it without that. 
And this is one of the indications that B um, should be counting the number of degrees of freedom at the boundary or defects, right? The degrees of freedom localized to the boundary or defect. Um, I'll come back to some of these points later when we do some examples and you'll see exactly how this works. The other point uh, proved about a year ago by Yifan Wang, which was that, again, if you have a, in a supersymmetric case, so if you add supersymmetry and your defects or boundary preserves at least a two-dimensional two comma zero SUSY, well, in that case, you're guaranteed to have a U1R current uh, at the boundary or defects, JA. It will have its own Etuft anomaly. Um, del A, JA will be K over four pi times F, where F is some external um, field strength for the U1R symmetry. And what Yifan showed was that B, in, in this case with supersymmetry, B is actually fixed by that uh, Etuft anomaly coefficient K. It's three times K with my normalizations. And then furthermore, he was able to show Using that, he was able to show that for an RG flow on the boundary or defects, B obeys B extremization. So this is, um, in two and four dimensions, this is something that happens in supersymmetric CFDs that um, if you want to determine, in general, the R currents in the UV can mix with other U1 currents. So in the infrared, it might be some combination of, of U1s. And the question is, well, what combination? And uh, there's A extremization or C extremization in four or two dimensions where you write down a trial A or C and you extremize it. Um, and that determines the R symmetry in the infrared. Uh, Yifan proved the same thing happens for a two dimensional boundary or defect. And this is really useful actually, and just practically when you have supersymmetry, it's a really useful way of actually computing B because in general, it's a lot easier to compute the Tuft um, anomalies than the trace anomaly. <clears throat> um, so I think that's it for B, uh, I'll move on to D1. Um, we don't know as much about D1. Uh, the main thing we know is that um, it shows up in the displacement two-point function. So going back to this word identity for the uh, non-conservation of the stress tensor, which is uh, which defines your displacement operator, um, that word identity is actually why the two-point function of the stress tensor, uh, its normalization just can't be any arbitrary number. It has to be uh, the central charge. Similarly, um, this word identity is why you can show um, in these papers that I've listed there that in the two-point function of the displacement operator, the uh, normalization has to be at least proportional to D1. So um, that is important because then um, you can demand through reflection positivity or unitarity, this two-point function um, has to be non-negative. And so therefore we know at least that there is a lower bound on D1. D1 has to be greater than or equals to zero. And actually, I think that was all I'm gonna say about D1. Yeah, we have, uh, I'll show some examples later where we find values, you know, you'll see explicit values of D1, but for now, that's the only sort of general thing that we know. Moving on to D2. So this is the coefficient of the vial tensor term. Uh, the very first thing to say is just to remind you that in three dimensions, the vial tensor vanishes identically. Um, so this D2 is only defined if the bulk CFT is dimension greater than three. Um, so technically it's only there for a defect. It's D2 is only defined for defects you know, in a four dimensional CFT or higher. It's actually not there if you have a 3D CFT with a boundary. Um, equivalently, yeah, it's if the, the defect has a co-dimension greater than one, then it's there. Um, we know a couple of things about D2. Um, one is that it actually shows up in the stress tensor one point function. Um, so I'll just remind you, or maybe you don't know, that um, when you break the conformal group down to this SO3 comma one cross SOD minus two symmetry, this subgroup, um, that symmetry actually allows the stress tensor to have a one point function at points away from the defect. And the symmetries, in, in fact, constrain the form of the one-point function to be what I've written here. And I think I've actually written this in Lorentzian signature, but it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> actually, no, that'll be important in a minute. Um, so yeah, so now I'm in Lorentzian signature. Um, those symmetries actually fix the form of the stress tensor one-point function up to a single constant, which I called H. And in these cases, with the two-dimensional defector boundary, what we showed, um, we and other people in these papers, listed at the bottom, what we showed is that this H is actually completely determined by D2 in this way that I've written at the bottom. So there's some up to some factors in front, H is proportional to D2. Um, and so this is nice. So this is saying this, okay, this defect central charge actually shows up in the stress tensor one point function. And so this is convenient again, because it gives you other ways. You know, if you wanna compute D2 
well, either you can compute the trace directly, but it's often more convenient just to compute the stress tensor one point function. And this is also useful because we can prove uh, something, we can prove a bound on D2 in the following way. We can use the average null energy condition, uh, which was recently proven for CFTs um, by Faulkner and company and also Hartman and company. And the average null energy condition is the statement that uh, if you have an, a QFT or a, it was proven the most rigorous proofs were for a CFT. And so if you have a CFT and you go to an excited state where the stress tensor gets a one point function and you then choose a null direction, which I called U, and this is why you need Lorentzian signature, you need a null ray. Um, if you integrate the one point function of the stress tensor over that null direction, it has to be, the result has to be non-negative. And intuitively, this is just saying that if you're in, a, in an excited state of the CFT, then um, the total energy measured by a, an observer moving at the speed of light should not be negative. If you take that, um, so if you take, uh, let me see, if you take the form of the one point stress tensor one point function that you wrote down, that I wrote down before, and you plug it into the null energy, average null energy condition, and you consider the null ray that I've drawn in this picture here. So I'll have my defects and I have a null ray that's uh, some distance away, you know, parallel to the defects and at some, it could be at some angle, but in particular, it doesn't it does not intersect the defect. So it's parallel to it. Um, then you can show in just a couple of lines, just putting those two ingredients together, that D2 has to be greater than or equals to zero. Or to say it differently, if D2 is negative, it violates, it'll violate the average null energy condition. Um, there's one caveat to this, which is that the proofs that I mentioned of the average null energy condition from these people were for a CFT without a defect. <laughs> so strictly speaking, there's not yet a proof that the average null energy condition is true in the presence of a defect. Um, we're working on that. Uh, we're almost certain that it will be true, um, but we're just, it's a, just technically more difficult than their proofs and, you know, and dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's is kind of a pain. However, I will say intuitively you expect it to be true for the reason I mentioned, because physically, you know, you expect that the total energy, even in the presence of a defect, as long as you know, it's reflection positive or, or unitary and so on, um, you still expect the total energy of a, a, an observer moving at the speed of light. Should, they should see a non-negative energy. So uh, let's see. Oh, I had one more thing to say about D1 and D2, which is that in um, if the bulk theory is a four-dimensional CFT and then you have a two-dimensional defect, I just say a, a CFT with supersymmetry and your two-dimensional defect preserves a two-dimensional two comma zero SUSY subgroup, then Bianchi and Lemos proved that D1 equals D2, right? So the supersymmetry uh, actually constrains D1 equals to D2. And then they conjectured that this remains true even when the bulk CFT is higher dimensional and they have a lot of evidence for that. Um, and I, I believe it's true as well. Um, just hasn't, again, another, another thing that hasn't been rigorously proven, but everybody thinks it's true. And I should say, this is also, um, this is useful for a number of things. You know, again, because if you have supersymmetry, it's often easier to compute these things. Um, and this also is another way of seeing that in these cases, at least D2 has to be positive because D1 has to be positive. Um, this might be a good point to stop. That was the trace anomaly. And I think that was everything I had to say. And so this might be a good point to pause and ask for any, any other questions. I'm not sure I can see the chat. There, there's, there were um, uh, basically two questions by Muhammad. Um, uh, more general in nature, though, I would suggest that um, we attend to them after. Yeah, I can see them. Um, let me go on. Uh, oh, how much time do I have left? Oh, uh, like f about five um, f minutes, maybe a little longer. Yeah. Okay. I should hurry up. Okay. Yeah. So, I'll give you the. <laughs> Take so do the entanglement. Uh, so I, I showed you the 2D CFT stuff. I'll just remind you that to get the central charge, um, you take this logarithmic derivative. Uh, the BCFT and DCFT cases are a little different. So I'll go through them separately. So for the BCFT case, I, I've drawn at the bottom here. Uh, so again, we fix, this is Lorentzian signature. We fix a time slice. And what I've drawn at the bottom here is my spatial directions R2 with my boundary at X equals zero. 
And so what we've done so far, um, we've considered an entangling region that's a semicircular radius L that's centered on the ring. And if you do that, um, what people have shown uh, and collaborators is that in general, the entanglement will have this form, right? It will look like, um, it'll look like the results for a 3D CFT times a factor of a half. Um, that factor of a half intuitively, you can imagine it's just because you've chopped off half of space time. <laughs> So relative to the normal CFT, you're getting half the amount of entanglement, um, plus a contribution from the, the 2D boundary. The 3D, the 3D part is just the form you expect for a 3D CFT. So the leading term is the length of your uh, semicircle over the cutoff, and there's some non-universal coefficients there. Uh, the 2D part that you get, the 2D contribution, um, looks a lot like a 2D CFT. It's a logarithm of L over epsilon, and the coefficient is B over 3. And then there's subleading terms that are not universal. <clears throat> and so then, uh, which in this case, if you want to get the physical information, you know, the cutoff independent um, information, you what you need to do is you take the full answer for the entanglement. You need to subtract off the bulk part, the one half uh, of the CFT entanglement part, and then take the logarithmic derivative times a factor of three, and that'll pick out B. So this is another way of computing B. Uh, and again, this part is pretty similar to a 2D CFT. B is essentially playing the role of the central charge there. In the DCFT case, so if the bulk CFT is higher dimensional, uh, it's a little different. So now I've drawn uh, my time slice with my D minus one spatial directions, and my defect is this black line in the middle. And here we consider a sphere of radius L centered on the defect. And here the, the story is similar. Uh, the entanglement entropy is, has two contributions. You get the part from the bulk CFT, which has the usual form of the area law term plus subleading stuff. It might have, you know, if the bulk is even dimensional, it might have a um, trace anomaly and you'll get a log term with the type A coefficient, which I've written there. Um, but then from the defect, what you'll get uh, is this thing I've written at the bottom. So you'll get a log contribution. And what's interesting is now you don't just get B. This confused us for a long time until we sorted it, sorted it out along with Nishioka and company back in 2018. What you get is actually a linear combination of B with D2. Um, and you'll see that the coefficient there of, of, in that log term at the bottom, that the coefficient of the D2 has a D minus three, so it, it vanishes in three dimensions and just goes back to the previous case. But in higher dimensions, you'll get this D2 there. Um, and for the experts in the room, that's coming, it ultimately comes from the stress tensor one point function. So if you do a um, Cassini, where it's a Myers type calculation, you know, um, there's a non-trivial contribution from the stress tensor one point function, which produces this D2. But in any case, then if you want to extract out the physical information about the defect, then again, you have to take your full answer for the entanglement, subtract the bulk part, the bulk CFT part, and then take a logarithmic derivative and you'll get this linear combination of B and D2. And that's interesting. You know, it's interesting that um, you're getting a type B uh, central charge in the log term of entanglement. It's the only example I know for a sphere, spherical region where that happens. And I think at the moment, that's everything we know about the entanglement entropy. And I think that pretty much summarizes everything we know about all these observables <laughs> um, for two dimensional boundaries and defects. And so the last thing I wanted to do was some examples. And since I'm, I'm short on time, I, I, maybe I won't do all of them, but I should go through one just so you can see this stuff explicitly. Um, and the simplest example is actually a three-dimensional BCFT of just free massless fields, because there you can calculate everything. Um, and so, you know, make a long story short, here's what you get. Um, so for a free massless scalar or Dirac fermion, um, these are the values of the boundary central charges you get. Um, of course, there's no D2 in this case, um, but for B and D1, you get these numbers. Uh, I should say the scalar, you know, you can have the, the conformally invariant boundary conditions are Dirichlet or Neumann. Um, for the fermion, you can have what I call mixed boundary conditions. And uh, I can explain that briefly, which is that, um, and this is probably familiar to people, that um, it, to have a well-posed variational problem for a Dirac fermion, you have to be a little careful with the boundary conditions. You define a projector using the gamma Dirac gamma matrix in the normal direction, gamma x. You define this projector that I've written here, 1 half, 1 plus or minus gamma x. You act on your Dirac spinner psi, that gives you some projected spinners, psi plus or minus. And then again, to have a well-posed variational problem, you impose Dirichlet on just one of those, psi plus or psi minus, and then you have to impose Neumann on the other. So that's what I mean by mixed boundary conditions. Um, 
But if you look at these values of B and D1, uh, there's a couple of useful lessons about them. And they illustrate some of the points that I made earlier. So for example, um, the first thing is that for the fermion, you see B equals zero, <clears throat> which is interesting. Um, in fact, you can see that the fermion looks like scalar with Dirichlet plus scalar with Neumann. B equals zero because as I mentioned, B has to be independent of boundary marginal coupling. That's the type A central charge. And what's interesting about the fermion is that if you take the Dirac mass operator and you evaluate it at the boundary, it's marginal with respect to the boundary. It's actually, um, uh, yeah, I think the counting is correct there. <laughs> um, but it's nevertheless gaps any boundary degrees of freedom. So it'll kill off any degrees of freedom at the boundary and B is counting those degrees of freedom. And so if you put those two facts together, um, you'll, you can argue that B has to be zero. And this is actually generically true. This is actually also true for in higher dimensions, but. Um, the other thing you'll notice is that the scalar with Dirichlet boundary conditions has a negative B, which um, was actually part of saying that the fermion looks like scalar Dirichlet plus scalar Neumann. And that's, um, well, that raises a question at least. I mean, the scalar with Dirichlet boundary conditions, we don't, we don't think violates unitarity. Um, and so you seem to be getting a negative value of B in the unitary theory. And so this raises the question of whether B has a lower bound. It's, uh, it's supposed to be counting degrees of freedom. And so you hope that it has a lower bound. Um, but at the moment, I should say, nobody knows um, whether B is bounded from below. Uh, there's one or two conjectures in the literature, but there's no proofs. Um, what you can also see from the, this example is that D1 is, is positive the way, the way it's supposed to be in all the examples. Um, I think the last thing is that um, the scalar actually gives you an example of the B theorem. It's a test of the B theorem because there is a way to get an RG flow on the boundary. So, um, yeah, so here's my slide. So you can start in the UV with the BCFT, that's the free massless real scalar with the Neumann boundary condition. And then you can trigger a boundary RG flow by introducing the, the scalar mass operator at the boundary. So I tried to write that here. You take your action of your BCFT and you add to it uh, at the boundary, the mass term for the scalar. And there's a, there's a delta x there to localize to the boundary, and then there's the normal mass term. And that operator, unlike the, the fermion, the scalar mass operator is actually relevant um, with respect to the boundary. It's dimension, phi squared is dimension one, which is less than two. So it's relevant with respect to the boundary. Um, and what, what happens is you get a boundary RG flow or in the infrared, you find a free massless real scalar. Uh, so the, the bulk CFT is the same, but now the boundary condition has changed. It's now become a Dirichlet boundary condition. And the intuition for this is that, well, in the UV with the Neumann condition, the value of the scalar at the boundary can be anything, but then you introduce this uh, mass term and it's, it's a parabolic potential, right? So it'll drive the scalar to phi equals zero in the infrared, which is the Dirichlet condition. And if you compare the values of, of B in the UV and the IR, it's just obvious in the UV it's one over 16 and the IR it's minus one over 16. And so it's bigger in the UV. And so the, in this case, the B theorem is obeyed. But of course, there's the question of why is it negative in the infrared and, and does it have a lower bound? More generally, does it have a lower bound? Um, I had more examples, but I think I'm short on time. So, well, I don't know, can I get, can I get a few more minutes or? Well, uh, we would like to allow people to ask questions. So um, maybe you can flash the examples at us. And if anybody is really interested in an example, then they can ask a question about it. Okay. Yeah, I can just say we looked at uh, the M5 brain theory, the 60 two comma zero CFT, and uh, you can introduce a 2D defect called a Wilson surface. It comes from this intersection of M2s ending on M5s. Um, the Wilson surface is like a Wilson line in, a, in that it's labeled by a representation of the gauge algebra, which is given by some young tableau. And we were able to compute um, two of the central charges for that defect. Uh, we could get B and D2, and we can write them in a very nice way uh, where lambda is the highest weight uh, vector of the representation and rho is the vial vector of the algebra. Um, I can say we got D2 exactly using a SUSY index calculation. That was pretty amazing. Uh, so this, this is the exact answer. And um, writing it this way, uh, you can prove that in this example, at least B and D2 are both positive. Um, I'm gonna skip these comments. Uh, there's one other example that's easy, which you go to ADS CFT and you consider just ADS space with some radius of curvature. You put in a probe brain, 
<coughs> whose world volume is ADS3, so that at the boundary, it looks like a two-dimensional defect. And you can calculate, and so you just write down this brain action with some tension and then integral over the world volume. Uh, and you can calculate all the central charges B, D1, and D2, and you find that they're all equal. <laughs> and uh, it's not surprising because this that system has only one dimensionless parameter, which is the tension in units of the ADS radius, L cubed times T. And then they all have the same coefficient. Um, it's very similar to holographic CFTs in D equals four, where, where A equals C, or in D equals six, where A equals C. This is the defect version of that. But I think that's it. Okay, so those are my examples. And so now I can wrap up. Uh, so the question was, can we define a central charge for these two-dimensional boundaries and defects? And hopefully I've convinced you that the answer is yes. <laughs> um, even though we don't have a Vera Soro algebra and all these quantities become more complicated, um, at least for the trace anomaly and the entanglements, uh, at the moment, there are meaningful ways to get defect or boundary central charges. And the outlook, um, of course, there's lots of open questions. You can always do more examples of these things. Um, there's the press energy to turn the thermal entropy. We still need to know what those look like. And then for a lot of the things I talked about, there's these questions of, do these central charges obey constraints? Do they have bounds? Do they obey C theorems? Of course, there's also, you know, what about the real worlds? You know, what about graphene and the easing model and other examples? Um, can we use any of these results? Can we apply any of these results to those cases to learn something? And then also, I mean, I was talking about two dimensional boundaries and defects, but you can ask about other dimensions. What about a four dimensional CFD with a boundary? And here there has been some progress. And this is my chance to advertise our paper today um, where we did a four dimensional boundary or defects in a CFT of dimension five or higher. We actually computed the form of the defects trace anomaly. And then Herzog, Huang and Jensen uh, did the case of a three dimensional boundary of a 4D CFD. And I mentioned our paper as well. I'll just advertise our paper because it actually had a pretty comprehensive review of almost everything I talked about. <laughs> we actually took the time to write a review. So. Anyway, that's it. Um, so thanks. And I'm happy to answer any of your questions now. Thank you so much, Andy, for, for a very, very um, entertaining, informative, and, and uh, understandable talk. Um, we should probably start with the question that uh, that ar did arise during the talk. So in that order, I think Muhammad was the first. Um, so uh, Muhammad, do you want to ask the question? I can also read it if you want me to. I mean, um, the first question was the Cardi entropy formula can be used uh, to calculate the black hole entropy. Can we observe the central charge and the temperature? So that's just a question about Cardi entropy? I think so, yeah. Uh, I would say in principle, yeah. Um, as far as actually doing this for a real astrophysical black hole, <laughs> that's a much harder question. Um, I mean, Astrominger and people have proposed um, ways of trying to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's pretty tough. Muhammad, feel free to, to unmute yourself, right, and, and chip in. But um, the, otherwise, I just remove, uh, read, read the second question that you had. In, in 2D, there are left and right moving temperatures and cha central charges. What is the physical meaning of the central charges and temperatures in Cardi entropy? Temperature is just the temperature. Yeah, and I think in the Cardi entropy, it's, uh, what is it, like, it's like T left plus T right over two, I think it's like average. If you have, um, and the, the central charge, I mean, I, I guess his point was that um, it, it's, it's a statement about the density of states at higher temperatures. Um, that would, it uh, what, scales like uh, e to the central charge or something like that, forget all the factors, but um, yeah, it's saying that the central charge controls the density of states at high temperatures, um, which, you know, I guess a priori was not obvious. I, mean, I guess in retrospect, people are very used to it, but I guess at the time it was not obvious. and um, and I think it's different. Uh, I know in higher dimensional cases, it's not so nice. Um, things are messier. Um, and I can say if you if you introduce different left and right central charges, so that you get you know things like a gravitational anomaly. Um, if some things change. I think the Cardi entropy is still the same though. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, uh, Mohammed, free free to to um, to. Uh, respond um, but yeah so let's let's um, um, mention the the next question so uh, 
Kirill, feel, feel free to ask the question. Okay. Hello. Thank you very much for, uh, for the talk. So uh, for, for free scalers and for uh, Dirac for Mint, uh, you showed that for, uh, or, uh, for D equals 3 BCFT, uh, B and D1 are all proportional to 1 over 32. So is there an intuitive reason for, for this circumstance? Um, my, my instinct is to say no, because I think it's just a normalization. Mm. However, I think, you know, I think a deeper point is that uh, I think we picked a norm. I can't remember what normalization we picked, but um, I think we might have picked one where if you put a, so if you just put a decoupled CFT at the boundary, it'll shift, it won't touch, it won't change D1, but it'll shift B2 by the, you know, the central charge of that CFT because it contributes to that trace anomaly. Um, and I can't remember what normalization we used compared to that. So I guess my honest answer is I don't know, but I could look it up. <laughs> okay, no, I'm just, which is just a speculative question, basically. Thank you. Yeah, no, but there's, that is interesting. Any other questions? Hey, Andy, I have a, I'm, I'm a bit puzzled by something. So sort of you, so first of all, thanks for the nice talk. Um, so I'm puzzled by the fact that, so you emphasized that the, the central charges are not central charges as in the sense of a central extension. But on the other hand, this B parameter that you show, showed satisfies so many similarities. So it, it's so similar to the central charge of the Verazoro algebra. In particular, I mean, it sort of, you, you showed that it basically counts the, the decrease of degrees of freedom along an RG flow which is something that the central charge does in Vero Zorro by means of, of controlling the representations which appear in the CFT. You see that, for instance, if you take a free boson, that tells you which, which uh, Vero Zorro representations appear, which are all at central charge one, the free like um, conformal weight um, alpha squared over four or whatever. And then if you decrease the central charge, then you only get, say, minimal model representations. And here, uh, sort of, I'm puzzled by the fact that this B is not, so I'm wondering if it's in a hidden way, a central charge so that you could sort of find a subalgebra in, in the algebra that you've already broken where this is central, but. Yeah, uh, 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 it's a good question. What I, can, what I can mention again is that the thing with these boundaries and defects is you can always consider the special case where you just have a decoupled, a genuine 2D CFT, but decoupled from the bulk CFT. And you just put it there on your boundary or defects. And in that case, everything you said would apply, right? So mm -hmm. it would contribute to be in a certain way. And there actually would be that, at least that subsector, that theory would have a Vera Soro and everything you said would be true. And the point of that is that, well, anything about you say about B has to be consistent with that special case. So it has to be able to reduce to the special case where, where the 2D CFT uh, stress tensor actually is conserved. Um, but then when you generalize to the case where the 2D stress tensor may not be conserved, um, that's where I can't answer your question. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Whether B, B is always, you know, um, the statements that I made are basically saying, well, we've been able to prove that some things remain true like the C theorem, basically, at least the weak form of the C theorem. Um, mm -hmm. And some things obviously don't, like the lower bound. Um, and so in general, I mean, I, I don't think anybody can answer your question. Um, okay. is, it, is it always you know, um, a central charge of some algebra? I think maybe, I'll just say one more thing, I guess, which is maybe a promising case would be a supersymmetric. If you have supersymmetry, then it might show up. <laughs> Okay. Related, related to any Tuft anomaly or something, it might show up as a central extension term somewhere. Although even there, I don't think it would behave, you know, I don't think it would not be exactly the same as a 2D CFT, right? Um, so yeah, it's a good question. And um, all right, thanks, I thanks. I don't, I don't think anybody has the answer right now. <clears throat> These are all good questions. <laughs>
Oh, is there a raised hand? I, I think Kirill's hand is raised. Did, do you want to ask again? Yes, yes. If it's yeah, possible. go ahead, please. Um, but it's, it's completely related to, 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 uh, to Christian's question. Um, uh, so if, if, one, if one does not consider T, no, no, uh, on, on, only as basic as kind of letter operators, but if one, is there a possibility to extend maybe the operator or to change the operator such that B becomes eventually something like a central algebra plus something? I mean, we don't need to only to think in, in, in terms of T as in a 2D CFT. Again, very specific yeah. question. Yeah, another good question. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, there is. I'm not sure I have anything intelligent to say about that. I agree. I'm not sure how how this fits in, but um, the. Entanglement entropy depends on when you define it in the way um, using the derivative, um, uh, well, defining the C function um, in, in, in terms of the entanglement entropy using a derivative uh, with respect to the characteristic length scale L. Um, yeah, right. Um, so it, it, just in general, this depends on the state, right? Because the, the um, entanglement entropy is depending on which state you would choose to evaluate it in. Yeah. So, for example, thermal states will have a different different behavior than than vacuum states, and that will lead lead to also different. If you if you take this for granted, this definition, then it will lead to different central charges and to different UV and IR behavior. In fact, you will see that the C theorem um, can be shown to be turned around into into like an anti C theorem, where you where you where you see that for thermal states, um, if you use this holographic definition of the holographic C function then you have an increase um, uh, along the RG flow as opposed to a decrease. And so I, I'm just wondering um, if maybe the fact that you, you managed to preserve a lot of this, like the st standard stuff from this lower, uh, from this 2D CFT on living on the defect, is it maybe possible to, to, to um, think of that as a subsystem where you have an, like a, where you perform a measurement and you have that in contact with the, with a bulk and then try to figure out um, like a C theorem that is not depending on temperature and on the state in that way that I just highlight. Yeah, another good question. <laughs> and, um, a, a lot of people have thought about that and I, nobody's come up with a great answer yet. Um, at least like a, except maybe in examples. Mm -hmm. But it's a good question. I mean, the problem with this point of view, like you're saying is that if you want a, a C theorem at the boundary or on the defects, it's always, you can't just, yeah, this is the issue. You can't just copy the existing proofs because you're getting, you don't have a conserved stress tensor and everything gets contaminated by the bulk CFT in the sense that you're saying there's like this extra bath of stuff. I mean, even at zero temperature, there's like, you can think of it as like an extra, extra degree, quote unquote, extra degrees of freedom mm -hmm. where you can exchange energy and momentum with it and you know, you're entangled with it. And so the question is always, well, can you somehow subtract that off and still get something monotonic, um, which I think is more or less the question you're asking. And I think the only case I mentioned the B theorem, which I called it was, was proven by Cassini and company using entanglement. So using essentially this definition. In that case with the 3D BCFD, he was able to at zero temperature prove this B theorem using um, Basically, positivity of uh, monotonicity of relative entropy, I think. And he didn't look at finite temperature because I think because it's not as universal as Cardi entropy. And also, he couldn't do it for the defect case precisely because the stress tensor got a one point function and that was cont contaminated his. He had to do, he had to compute, you know, or define some kind of relative entropy where the bulk was subtracted off. And if you have the, what he found was that if the stress tensor has a one point function that that gets spoiled. So that's why his proof is only for the BCFT case and not the DCFT case. But yeah, and then for your question with the temperature, everything gets even messier, right? Because mm -hmm. hardly anything's universal and it's hard to calculate anything. Um, in a certain sense, it's a similar problem. Like you, you have two two contributions to what you call the number of degrees of freedom before, right? Mm 
um, there's the, like the, the standards, like the basic definitions, um, like what are the degrees of freedom uh, of your UV theory um, counted in some way, uh, right? And we would say that's the standard C function. Um, but then, then there's the there's also the question like how many accessible states are there? Like that is another like a different different question, and that would mix in when you just use this thermal C function definition. And here it's a similar uh, thing. You you have contributions to the number of possible or accessible states or possible degrees of freedom um, from the bulk and from the defect. Yes. Yeah. So, Maybe your your techniques can help to to sort that out somehow and and make it cleaner. Like what what belongs to what? Sorry, I don't have an answer. I just wanted to to yeah, ask the question how you thought about this. No, uh, that's what everybody's asking. Um, okay, exactly these things. Um, it is weird, you know, the sense saying that B counts degrees of freedom at the boundary. I mean, probably number of states or something is better um, because even in this example with the free fields, like scalar with Dirichlet, you don't think of that as having, intuitively you wouldn't think that has degrees of freedom at the boundary and yet B is not zero, in fact, it's negative. Yeah, what's the negative number of states? Yeah, yeah is that a number of states? Is that a degree of freedom? I mean, what is, mm -hmm. this is tied up in the question of, well, does B have a lower bound? And if so, why, you know, like what, um, what would bound? People have more progress. I didn't talk about it, but you can do a 2D theory with the boundary. Uh, it's a little easier. Um, they've made a little more progress there. You can define a similar thing as a boundary entropy. Um, there are lower bounds on that, which are negative. Um, people argue that, well, the degrees of freedom, number of degrees of freedom at the boundary can be a little bit negative as long as the total number of degrees of freedom is, remains positive counting bulk and boundary. But the question remains, nobody knows you know, how to how to get a lower bound. I should it's a good place, you know, if anybody does CFT bootstrap, you know, it's a good place to <laughs> people are hoping that there's bootstrap bounds on these things. To, maybe we can have another like one last question if anybody has one or comment. If there are none, then I say thank you again, Andy, and thanks everyone for participating. That concludes our session today. Thanks a lot. Thank you.